Nephi is in his prophetic vein, and he's going to take us all the way. We're on the 25th chapter of 2 Nephi here, and we just mentioned that, incidentally, that, uh, that article I quoted from the last time was, I'll put it down here, was in the Enkel Jude, the big blue books, the uh, Encyclopedia Judaica, and it's in volume 9, and I think it was, yes, 1568 to 1575. Now, here we go. Wherefore, look, the 18th verse, you got the 18th verse, we just referred to Toynbee and so forth. He shall bring forth his words, his words unto them, which words shall judge them at the last day. The purpose of these words is convincing them of the true Messiah. Then it says here that there should be no other Messiah, save it should be a false Messiah. There were many false Messiahs came forward. Robert Eisler collected quite a number of them. The most famous of those was uh, Sabbatai Svi in 1648. Uh, Sabatai Tzvi. You can say it with a Z if you want it with an E. They, they just write it like this, Tzvi, the Jews today, right? Sabatai Tzvi. Uh, and 1648, you know what date that was, if we asked you on a vocabulary test. What was the treaty? What was that? Of course, it ended the Thirty Years' War, 1648. Uh, very. Uh, but at that time, uh, Chilniki, uh, Hetman Chilniki, uh, a leader of the Cossacks, revolted against the Polish crown and uh, swept over the land, <laughs> selecting the Jews as his, special, as his special victims. Terrible pogroms, pogroms all over Europe, and uh, especially in Poland, and the Jews became very discouraged. They, they hoped for a Messiah. This must be the end time, they thought. They hoped for a Messiah. And this fellow, who was a young Turkish Jew, who was born in Saloniki, he emerged as the Messiah. And all the Jews in Europe and elsewhere got all excited about him. His headquarters were in Cyprus, and everyone decided this was the Messiah. Then all of a sudden, he got converted to Islam. He became a Muslim. Well, you can imagine the effect that would have on the Jews. They just cast them down completely. And if the day was saved by 1700 uh, by Baal Shem, Israel Baal Shem, the person who's known by Baal Shem, in 1700 Baal Shem appeared. He was a lord of the name. He appeared uh, wandering around among all the communities in Europe and so forth preaching the Hasidic doctrine. He was a Hasidic Jew. A Hasid means a saint, sacred, which was one of God's love and tolerance and that everything is going to be all right. And it was, it was, a, very, uh, it was a very uplifting doctrine, purely spiritual and so forth, nothing but peace and so forth. And such people as Martin Buber and uh, Arnold Zweig were uh, Hasidic in that sense. Now, some years ago, Abraham Kaplan from Israel I think he's at Tel Aviv now, I think. Uh, he's been here a number of times. He's the great Jewish authority on the temple. He's, we've thought, had some wonderful discussions with him on the temple. But he, uh, he was here, and he was a real Hasidic Jew, preaching this gentleness and so forth. But the last time he was here, he changed completely. He was a real Hasidic Jew now. That means going back to the old literalism. See, all the Jews who've ever joined the church were Hasidic Jews, excluding my great-grandfather. They, were, uh, they believed these things in a literal sense. They didn't... Uh, and make them abstract and allegorical the way the, the rabbis do. It's very interesting that the that Hasidism started out, well, it reverted again to this, to this doctrine, well, don't put your faith in anything physical or anything literal or anything like that. We just have to exercise what love and patience we can. It was a great doctrine, but uh, Kaplan finds more punch now in, in Hasidic Judaism, apparently. Well, anyway, the... Uh, no, unless it should be a false messiah. There were many false messiahs, and the Jews got all, got all excited about it because they had missed the real one. And his name shall be Jesus Christ. That, of course, is translation meaning Jesus, the Savior, and Christ, the Messiah, the, the Anointed One, from the Savior, the Anointed One, Jesus Christ. And of course, they, it's a very interesting thing. In the early parts, the, messiah, oh, uh, the Book of Mormon only refers to the Messiah. It's only here that he starts referring to Christ. It's an interesting thing that later on, now he calls him Christ from here on. But earlier, he's always called Messiah, which means the same thing, of course, the Anointed One. And it tells us about coming out of the lines of Egypt and so forth, and uh, that he should heal them about Moses. He should heal them after they'd been bitten by the poisonous serpent. And if they would cast their eyes unto the serpent, which he did raise before them, and also give them power to smite the right. Does anyone please explain to us what we, how he could heal them by the serpent if they'd been made ill by the, well, made mortally, deadly ill by the biting of the serpent? Remember we're told in Exodus that the, the wild serpent, the serpents came in great numbers and bit the people. And Moses raised a brazen serpent on a staff, and whoever looked to the serpent would be healed. 
So by the curse, the curse is removed. What is the point of that, you see? <laughs> what do you mean by washed blood, washed white in the blood of the lamb? Why would the blood of the lamb wash you white and so forth? The same thing there, the same ambivalent meaning. There are two kinds of blood, and it's explained in the Book of Mormon and nowhere else where these things mean. But the serpent, of course, is the most ambivalent of members. Now, you know what the caduceus is. You know the doctors. Some of you parents have doctors, or are going to be doctors, you know the caduceus, the two serpents intertwined, which is the sign of the healer, because Aesculapius found it, but it's originally the staff of Hermes, and Hermes found it when there were two serpents copulating on the staff, and he picked it up and made it his symbol. You see, the one stands for life, and the other for death. There's always the two serpents. And to this day, in the Greek Orthodox Church, in the Russian Orthodox Church, in the Serbian Church, the staff of the Archbishop, head of the church, always consists of a cross, but with two serpents entwined on it. Two serpents facing each other on the cross. Strange thing to go back like this and face each other. All these staves, the Episcopal staves and uh, patriarchal staves of the, of the Orient, of the Eastern churches, the old churches, have the two serpents. The one, of course, is life and the other is death, and you must have both. This opposition in all things and so forth. It's very clear among the Indians, if you, the Hopis and the snake dance, they won't let you there anymore, will they? This year they, they shut it to the public. but. Uh, it's very clearly explained by them. You must pass. This is a, an Egyptian formula too. You must pass through the serpent in this land, in this earth. We must pass through the serpent. We go to the lowest stage. You see, they don't like those serpents or anything like them. But they have to live with them. They have to accept them. They have to recognize their own weakness. Joseph Smith in Zion's camp, remember lifting the serpent up and says, "And thus man can get along with each other." And he, uh, the uh, the beasts will be their enemies and so forth. Well, that's teaching from the Talmud, too. But the two serpents are the serpents that oppose each other, and they represent us both parts of life. We have to have life, and we have to have death. On this earth, the two go together, you see. And by the bite of the serpent, that ends it, but by the serpent, how are we saved? Well, the reason you can see, obviously, the reason the Egyptians take it, not necessarily that, as a symbol of resurrection, so forth, is that it shades its skin. It becomes really new and shiny every year. It leaves its old skin behind, and everything's left behind, and out it comes. And like a new creature, reborn. It's, a, it's the most, one of the most striking symbols of rebirth. Now the others, like the frog, they use the tadpoles and the caterpillars and so forth. They change their nature while maintaining their identity from a, a cocoon to a caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly and so forth. They change their nature, but they change their appearance, whereas the snake gets reborn uh, and stays himself keeping his same appearance. And so, but anyway, the, the ambivalence of, of the serpent is, is very ancient, and it's a symbol that was understood by the ancients. That seems so contradictory to us, to a thing like that. It's not so, though. And the name by which Sabu is Now notice all this emphasis on writing in the 21st verse. These things which I write shall be kept and preserved and handed down from generation to generation, that the promise may be fulfilled unto Joseph that his seed should never perish as long as the earth should stand. Why is it necessary? to preserve the seed and so forth. Why these things? Uh, and notice, it goes on. As long as the earth shall stand, they shall go according to the will and pleasure of God, and the nations who shall possess them, those shall be judged according to the words which are written. But this importance of writing all the time will be judged by them. For we labor diligently to write to persuade our children. And the, the Dead Sea Scrolls show this. When I was at Claremont, I, I uh, taught junior humanities at Scripps College, alternately with Edgar Goodspeed, who had retired from the University of Chicago. He was the grand old man of New Testament study. And he insisted back in those days, he says the Jews didn't write a word in the same, because they were illiterate. They wrote in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek because the Jews didn't write. Ordinary Jews didn't write Hebrew or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, the Dead Sea Scrolls, he died uh, conveniently, and the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Well, I, I would teach the class on Thursday, and he'd, he'd take it on Tuesday, you see, and the point is, and the say, but, but that's a good speech, said the Jews didn't write at that time. Well, I certainly wrote, they wrote all over the place. They couldn't stop writing. They had an obsession with writing, as the Dead Sea Scrolls show. They had a scribendi cacoethes, as the Greeks called it. They couldn't, they couldn't stop writing. And they do write everything. They have this, well, after all, how did the law come down? The Lord wrote it, supposedly, with his own finger on the tablets and handed the tablets to Moses, just like, like Moroni had written it with his fingers painfully and handed the plates to, to Joseph Smith later on. <laughs> Strange thing is handing down, because it's the greatest invention that ever was, as, as Galileo says, compared with writing, any other invention uh, pales in significance. It goes far beyond television or anything like that, <laughs> because it can preserve over any limit of time and any space Nothing simpler than just something to scratch and something to scratch on. Not only what people did, but what they thought, their innermost, their, their, their most subtle emotions and everything. So it's all sorts of life and everything. 
Homer can still make us weep, I mean, and uh, you can get all excited about Egyptian texts or what, these things. After all that span of years, time or place, it'll always be there. But of course, it wasn't an, it wasn't an invention. Oh, I, we read that before, didn't we, that writing on We mentioned that, which he called the, the genesis of the written word that isn't necessarily revealed, find in the temples. But this emphasis on writing, it's so important for the Book of Mormon because it is a book. It goes by that title of the book. And notice, we keep the law of Moses, looking forward with steadfastness unto Christ. <laughs> Professor Cross, Frank Cross of, of Harvard, who's been here quite a number of times, uh, he, uh, he gave the, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls people the name the Church of Anticipation, because we mentioned before, as Norman Gold has shown now, Gold has shown now, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls people are always looking for it. They sound like Christians on them, but they're not Christians, they're Jews. They always look for them. So he called it the Church of Anticipation. Everything is anticipating the Christian church. Well, that's exactly what we have here. He says it points our minds forward. We're anticipating what's to come. That's why we keep the law of Moses in anticipation of other things to be revealed. Exactly what happens in, in the Sarek scroll, for example. For this end was the law given uh, to prepare us. And, but it is really Christ. It is the Messiah. The whole thing has to do with him. Now this comes right in the right place here, where he says, you notice, we look forward to what are we looking forward to? One thing, to Christ. We're obsessed with that, he says. We talk of him, we rejoice in it, we preach it, we prophesy Christ, we write it, the prophecies and according, we speak, that we may know the deadness of the law. Why would you teach the law if it was just to teach the deadness? Well, the law is the iron rod. The law is the liahona. Remember when the woman shows it to his, uh, uh, to his son? The, uh, the iron rod was shown it by his father, rather. When he was 10 years old. There was the Leohon. It was kept among the national treasures, but it didn't work anymore. And uh, once it had performed its function of leading them through the desert, you see, then it become excess baggage. And the same thing with the iron rod. When you reach the iron rod, it says, here, you have to let go. Otherwise, you, the, the, law is, uh, the rod is not the goal. It will take you where you're going. But when you're there, you let go. And the, it was to be that, as he says, as guidance. That verse of, uh, of uh, Newton is the Newtonian verse, remember? Praise the Lord for he has spoken, worlds, worlds, notice plural, his mighty word obeyed. Laws that never shall be broken for their guidance he has made. The laws are for our guidance, they're to lead us where we are going. They, lack to they are the head of the guide through the desert. The hood, as the Arabs call it. So we speak about the law that our children may know that it's dead and that we may look forward to that life which is in Christ and know for what end the law was given. It's guidance. It's to lead us there. The law isn't the all. But remember, it becomes the obsession. After the temple was destroyed, you see, what can they do except discuss the law? They go, and that's why we have the Talmud, the Mishnah, and all that. It's, it's all discussion of the law. That's what the Talmud does. It discusses the law. And boy, do they, do they uh, split hairs. The... Uh, when is it day and when is it night? See, the new, the new day begins at a certain time. It's important to determine when it's done. Well, it's when you can distinguish between two strings, a black string and a white string. Well, how black and how white? How long do those strings have to be? Well, at what distance do they have to be? It says at arm's length. At, at whose arm's length? At, a, at the arm's length of a man six feet tall. Uh, and so it goes. You see, you're splitting hairs and trying to find exactly what is what. This is the letter of the law. But it's the only thing they were had left with after they rejected the Messiah. So notice, they hardened their hearts against him when the law ought to be done away. They become hard, and it's like hardening arteries. Uh, you get hardened, set in your ways, and you will not be receptive anymore. The thought has to be fluid. As we, we know that that's the expression we use, that sort of thing. Uh, we say, uh, well, anyway, the law is sufficient to teach any man the right way and to worship him. Now, inasmuch as you must keep them, notice the 30th verse is important too. You must keep the performances and ordinances. The ordinances aren't going to save you, the performances aren't you, but you must keep them because they'll point your, point your mind forward of the law until the law shall be fulfilled. It's going to keep you on the path till then. It's a discipline. Uh, that discipline is important. The law having no particular effect or virtue in itself. Old Leopold von Anhalt Dessau, uh, predecessor of Frederick the Great, he built up the Prussian army and made it the great machine that it was. And how did he do it? He introduced the manual of arms, a perfectly useless ornamental display. All these port arms, present arms, and so you go through this regiment, then you march stiffly and artificially with the Paso Romano, the goose step. Uh, this is artificial. Why do you do it? Well, it made the army. It wasn't necessary, but it was a discipline. It got men acting together. It got them taking orders, see? It, it put some form into things. Before then, say in the Thirty Years' War, just before, when people went to war, the armies would drag it along, you'd drag your guns like 
coming back from Moscow or something like that, Napoleon. But uh, old Leopold, who died of a, an apoplectic stroke when he heard that his 13th child was learning to read, that's the kind of a guy he was, old gunpowder face, is, is, uh, what's his name, calls him, uh, Macaulay. The, uh, he built the army doing these purely artificial things. I mean, and this is what, as I mentioned before, we had to shave every day in the 101st. You know, that had to be done. That was all to it. Had an effect. Well, then, after Christ has come, we're going on here. We've got to get to the prophecy of our times. Generations shall pass away, and then the proud that do wickedly shall burn and be as stubble. Notice that complete, complete consumption. And then one of those emotional outbursts of Nephi in the seventh verse. Oh, the pain and the anguish of my soul for the loss and slain of my people. He sees it all. For I, Nephi, have seen it, and it is well nigh consumeth me before the presence of the Lord, and I must cry, God, and to my God, thy ways are just. Just more than he can stand. Behold, the righteous shall not perish. It's interesting. Every time it ends, this mentions this being com consumed as stubble. That means by fire and completely <laughs> overburn. That's what it is. You see, after the field has been cut, then you burn it over. That's the stubble, uh, the great overburn. But the righteous are told they shall not perish. We're not told how. We have to leave that up to the Lord. The main thing with you, the only concern with you is to be righteous. See, this is the point. But the son of righteousness shall appear unto them, and he shall heal them and have peace with them uh, until three generations have passed. Now, this is a paradox again. Why is the gospel there? Why all this trouble? If this is the plan of salvation for the whole human race, and so forth, why has it had so few takers? I mean, it not only hasn't been possible, everybody just ignored it year after. Well, that's what happens in the Old Testament. You didn't keep it. They didn't keep the law. That's what the prophets storm about. That's what Moses says in his farewell. You've never kept the law at all. And with the Lord, the same way, even his disciples left him at the end. You see, he stands up. He must tread the wine press alone. Of course, nobody else could do that. But uh, he was not well received, as you know. Well, what's the whole idea of giving something like this? Of course, John tells us right at the beginning. The light shines in the dark, and the darkness comprehends it not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave power to become the sons of God. Some, you can receive him if you're willing, and he will give you power to become sons of God. So that is a big thing, you see, if you could bring that off. So it's not contradicting that very few go uh, eternal life in the presence of God and the angels. It's not bought so cheaply. It's got to be at the highest price. So few are going to take it here. But it's got to be here. Some are qualified at all, and this is the way it is. They've been very favored. But then here, then he speaks about himself. And he'll have peace, but they'll, after three generations, then they'll reject him. And then when that happens, the tenth verse, a speedy destruction cometh unto my people. There. When the Spirit ceaseth to strive with man, then cometh speedy destruction. That's 80. That's the time when the Spirit will not, no longer strive with man. He says, my Spirit will not always strive with man. It must needs be that the Gentiles be convinced also that Jesus is Christ, the eternal God, that he manifests by power of the Holy, himself by the power of the Holy Ghost unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, working mighty miracles, signs, and wonders accord, according to their faith, you see. It will be received according to the faith to receive it. And of course, this is what we have. Be done according to your faith. But behold, I prophesy unto you concerning the last days. <clears throat> now, this should interest us from here on. When the Lord shall bring these things forth unto the children of men. It's our time. After my seed and the seed of my brethren shall have dwindled in unbelief and shall have been smitten by the Gentiles, nay, after the Lord shall have camped around about them. The, uh, incidentally here, after the, this lowering of the Indians, the Indians were pretty strong in the 1820s at this time. They, they occupied most of the country and the tribes were, they'd received the horse, they used, for example, and become very warlike, very effective, and there were whole great nations and the like. But this shows us the Indians completely ground down, just reduced to an empire. There's almost nothing left before the tide is going to turn here. And after they shall have been brought down low in the dust, they, even that they are not yet, they are not, yet the words of the righteous shall be written. He's talking about the record and so They shall not be forgotten. They shall speak out of the ground, low out of the dust. We mentioned the nah, hey, Nahal Cave or caves and so forth. And they shall write the things which are done among them. We talked about, well, there's Dead Sea Scrolls, among other things. And it shall come to pass, those who have dwindled in unbelief shall be smitten by the hand of the Gentiles. And then, now it's the Gentiles' turn. And the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled. Notice he's using the present tense. It's a very interesting thing in, in Greek, you know. In historical accounts, you, you only use the present tense for future, past, or anything else, because as you talk about it, it's happening. See? You only use the present tense in, in uh, narrative, in historical narrative. 
So we just stick to the present. He's doing the same thing here. Of course, this is a thousand years ahead of him, 2,000 years. Oh, no, this is 2,500 years ahead for him. And he says, the Gentiles and the Gentiles who have dwindled in unbelief shall be smitten, and the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of the greatness of the stumbling block. And there are many churches, notice the great and abominable is, is a composite as far as that goes. Uh, nevertheless, they put down the power and miracles of God and preach up unto themselves their own wisdom and their own learning, notice the two things, and grind upon the faces of the poor. Positivism and materialism, those become the main trends in, in, in Christian studies. You know. There are many churches, there you are again. He's, he told us once there was but one church. That's, that's your big composite that covers everything. Now he says there are many churches which cause envyings and strife and malice. Of course, they're always competitive. But that happens within every church. All churches are full of envying and strife and malice, including ours. You, you know that. Uh, some wards, I'm saying, not everywhere, but it happens. Of course it does, it's human nature. Uh, there are also secret combinations. Now, this, this gets more serious, you see. According to the combinations of the devil, they are the foundation of murder and works of darkness. Yea, he leadeth them by the neck with a flaxen cord until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever. So here, of course, we immediately think of, of the mafia here, or things like this, the, the secret combinations, works of darkness, the foundation is, is murder, and the foundation and the word, because that's the basic, that's their product, what the mafia sells, its product that, that brings its, its biggest income, of course, is murder. Amazing business, isn't it? Of course, it's the same with the military, of course. Being military, I'd say myself. <laughs> Not so direct, but it's arms makers and things like that. You, you can make quite a list, you see, of those who, the, uh, what you say, the, uh, the, um, Ma the Mahan pencil. I'm master of this great secret that I may murder and get gain. You can convert life into property. You can do it all over the place. It's always done. We won't go into that now. But here, the Lord worketh not in darkness. Now, this is interesting because of the militant orders, orders that came, that rose after the time of the Crusades. And they were very secret. And uh, I'm talking about the Templars and, uh, and the others. And they, they degenerate into the Shlorafian fraternities and things like that. They've, uh, they've been all over the place. And some of them are quite militant and full of mischief. Have been, rather. But he loveth the world, and he draweth all men unto him. Wherefore, he hath commanded none that they should not partake of his salvation. Of course, the church is not exclusive. Does he say to anyone, depart from me? Nay. Depart out of my synagogues, or out of my houses of worship? Notice he recognizes them. This 26th verse. Has he commanded them they should part, part out of the synagogues, or out of my houses of worship? Uh, corruption and cynicism should turn us not away from religious in, in religion in general, from religion itself. I mean, uh, we start out with that, you see. That's what, that's what we have to have. And then which direction you take, that's, decide, that's up to you to decide. I say unto you, nay, for he's given free notice, free for all men. He has commanded his people that they should persuade. So we have to work on it, you see. He should persuade all men to what? Repentance. That comes the first thing. That is the message of the missionary. Speak nothing but repentance to this generation, because that's what we have to have. That's what we do from day to day and always, all the days of our life. And the ninth chapter of Nephi says he's, he's lengthened our days just to give us a better chance to repent. And no one has less need to repent than another, as far as that, because because the greater your virtues, the greater the responsibility you have for the things you haven't done and so forth. I mean, if you know more than someone else, you have a greater responsibility to someone who knows less. So you have to repent just as much, if not more, than he does, that you're not studying enough, that you're not doing enough. Behold, all men are privileged, one like unto another, and none are forbidden. You'll just write across the page there, if you have this edition, in the last end of the last verse of this chapter, he says, and he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, this is Paul, you see, male and female, and he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. Did any of you see that remarkable uh, uh, thing on the uh, on uh, Esteban and Domingo? Uh, yesterday it was on, it was on uh, Channel 7, I think it was. The first, uh, the first uh, to visit this valley here in 1776. Esteban came here, and uh, the interesting thing was it showed photographs of Indians like the Paiutes down here. Those Paiutes are very interesting, you see. They, had, they all had beards. They were bearded Indians. They weren't like the other Indians. Indians don't have heavy beards, but these had beards and uh, very, very uh, European features, well, New recent features. Strange things, these Indians that turn up, as I say, like the blondes among the Hopis and so forth. But anyway, that's getting off the track here a little bit. 
Priestcrafts are that men set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may gain in the praise of the world. They seek not the welfare of Zion. That's very interesting when he says they seek not the welfare of Zion. He's talking about somebody who's in Zion in that case who set themselves up for light and want to get gain and praise. Well, I know lots of businessmen and others who've got a free ride on the church. It's sad. But you find that in every church, too. Might as well be frank about these things. Uh, and here's the, how do we deal with these people? Next verse makes it clear. You should have charity. You don't judge them at all. Of course not. Well, anyway, all men should have charity. Which charity is love? Except they should have charity, they were nothing. So this is how we deal with these things. You have charity, you have love, and without that, you're nothing. Charity, they would not suffer the labor in Zion. No, she's talking about Zion here. If they had charity, they wouldn't suffer the labor in Zion to perish. And there he really hits it hard. The labor in Zion shall labor for Zion. For if they labor for money, they shall perish. Laboring in Zion. Wow. Better watch it here. The, and again, the Lord God has commanded we should not murder, should not steal. Notice the list of things. Uh, here we have real, uh, the real primetime TV show. This is the evening uh, best hours when you see, notice, murder, stealing, envy, malice, contention, and whoredoms. They make the program. That is the, that is the rich mix that makes the big selling TV program today. They'll go over everything. And then he says, uh, he begs all to come to his goodness. He denieth none. It's like black and white, so come. Notice he moves between these things. Uh, he sees the, the evil gets right to the heart of it and says, but you must forgive, you must tolerate these things. We're all being tested together. The Lord wants all everybody to have a chance and so forth. And then he goes down and really warms up in the next chapter. Behold, in the last days, the days of the Gentiles. Notice the last days are called the days of the Gentiles. They certainly haven't been the days of the Jews. All nations of the Gentiles and also the Jews and both those who shall come upon this land and on other lands. So that's the works, that's all of us. Even upon all lands of the earth will be drunken with iniquity and all manner of abominations. Notice this is the way they are. All the nations that fight against Zion, we'll see who Zion is if you turn to the 21st chapter, uh, the 28th chapter, 21st verse. Uh, we, uh, you don't identify yourself with that uh, to establish your virtue. Uh, yes, the 21st verse. All is well in Zion. Woe to those who say all is well in Zion. Well, we get to Zion, prospereth all is well. He leadeth them carefully down to hell. If they do that, it's too much of that. You see. But notice this. It's the, the Theatromania. This, this is marvelous, this third verse. Of course, it's quoted from the prophet. Uh, all the nations that fight against us shall be as a dream of a night vision. They shall be like a man who's hungry. He dreameth, and behold, he eateth. He awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or like unto a thirsty man which dreameth, and behold, he drinketh. He awaiteth, and he behold, he is faint. His soul hath appetite, and even so shall the multitude of all the nations be. Notice the state of mind you're in. You think you have it, you think you have it made. This is the delusion, of, say, of drugs, or the delusion of wealth and plenty, or of, uh, or of too much prosperity, whatever it is. But you notice the whole thing. We're in a sort of uh, a dream state now. The wildest things happen. People uh, uh, feel no outrage at the most terrible crimes that are committed in our midst and so forth. But the whole thing is like a dream. It's what the ancients called theatromania. Uh, I still have an article I got to write on theatromania. No, actually, as you can see, it means theatromania. Uh, the appearance is everything. The show is everything. You notice the people that count in our society? Uh, uh, um, theatro, mania, a mania for the theater, for spectacles and sights. To become, everybody becomes a spectator. Everybody becomes a watcher. So the heroes of our time are people like De Niro and so forth, men who regard as, as giants of the art. They can't play anything, they can't dance, they, they can't perform maybe. Everybody can act more or less. As far as that goes, I have a couple of kids in the business, oi, oi, oi. And, uh, but uh, when it comes to that, that's what he's talking about. It's an unreal world we live in. It's, it's quite unreal, do you know that? Of course, this was recognized already in the 19th century, European century. The uh, Bill, uh, Grill parts, his famous play, Trau mein Leben, Leben is to do with the emperor and so forth, and things aren't really real. Well, the same thing is so in Rome. That's why they, the ancients call it that. People spend all their times at the games and shows. Athletics became everything with them. They had these enormous coliseums and stadiums. We still use their words for that. We still have the same sort of games. And they get rougher and rougher and more violent. And just for violence sake, like tag wrestling, roller derby, <laughs> demolition derbies, and such cultural events as those. <laughs> what a society. <laughs> well, that's it. It's not real. We think we've got it, you see. We dream of a night vision. We dream of a hungry man. Well, 
how often you're hearing today the American dream has gone down the drain. There's too much of a dream that all this prosperity and so forth, it could be and so forth. But what has happened? As I say, that to, to, tap, to top it all off is the final thing where you can uh, take a pill or a shot and it will really put you into nirvana or, or some happy state. See, but it's all unreal. And then when you awake, then comes the... It's, 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 it's uh, coming around and curing yourself of terrible things. So, uh, now, in this example of prophetic language that follows here, I, I think Brother Sperry was right here. It, it moves freely. The spirit, as the spirit listeth, and is addressed to spiritually receptive audiences at various times and places and parties. Uh, time and space swim together, sort of, in this prophetic language. And you, as it said, you have to have the same spirit to follow. But he goes on here, notice here. And ye shall be drunken with wine and stagger, but not with strong drink. Well, I have plenty of strong drink, too. Behold, the Lord hath poured out the spirit of deep sleep. Everybody slowed down. Nobody seems to know anything today or what's going on. Uh, well, it, all you had to do was listen to these political debates to see them missing one ball after another. Somebody would throw a fast one, the other guy would miss it entirely. Nobody is sharp on the uptake anymore. Everybody wanders around and generalizes and avoids issues and so forth. It's wild, you see. It says, the spirit of deep sleep, behold, you, you have closed your eyes, and you've rejected the prophets and your rulers and the seers he has covered because of your iniquity. Using very interesting, the old Hebrew word there, kafar. He's taken them from you. He's covered them. Uh, and uh, we're out of touch with reality. See, we definitely are on TV, Disneyland. Uh, if ever I visited Disneyland, if you wanted my idea of hell, it would be Disneyland. I, I mean, that is hell, as far as I'm sure. Everything is artificial in it. Nothing is real. You begin to have illusions. You begin to feel sick. Uh, well, we won't go into that. We're not poor advertising for Orange County. Uh, but, uh, and then he shall bring the words of a book. Now, this isn't the Book of Mormon he's talking about. This is another book, apparently. The words of a book, they shall have words of them that have slumbered. The book shall be sealed, the beginning of the world to the end thereof. See, the Book of Mormon doesn't go from the beginning to the ending of the world. But it's the sealed part does. This is the point. This is just a small part. The big part was sealed. Big plates, you see. And this is what he's talking about. Because of the things which are sealed up, the things which are sealed shall not be delivered in the day of the wickedness and abominations of the people. Wherefore, the book shall be kept from them. They do get the Book of Mormon, not the sealed words. Notice the 10th verse. But the words which are sealed, he shall not deliver. Talking about the man who, to whom the book is delivered. He shall not deliver those. Neither shall he deliver the book. For the book will be sealed until his own due time, the Lord says. That they may reveal all things from the foundation of the world to the end thereof. Well, the Book of Moses comes nearest to that. But of course, the Book of Moses is a very small book. That's, uh, that, that's not the one that's sealed. That's another thing. It's a remar the more, as remarkable as the Book of Mormon every bit. Well, the book shall be read from the housetops when it comes, and all things shall be revealed then. The book shall be hid. And then it talks about three witnesses then, because there are always three witnesses. See, it doesn't have to be the three witnesses of the book of Mormon. The scripture says, in, in the mouths of three witnesses shall all things be established. This one has three witnesses too. No, then he says, take these words which are not sealed. And in the 15th verse, he's talking about this could refer to the case of, of for Charles Anton. Uh, when Martin Harris took the place to Charles Anthon. Well, why did he take the place to Charles Anthon? Charles Anthon at that time, 1830, couldn't read uh, Egyptian. Nobody could. Uh, and um, he, he claimed he recognized the signs and so forth and could read them at the... Uh, he said, how can I read the seals? But, well, he had to take them to the learned Spanish, and he was. Charles Anthon was, without any doubt, the best classical scholar, the best antiquarian in the country, one of the very best in the world. He produced a magnificent, a masterful dictionary of, of antiquities. So Joseph Smith, so that the Mormons, they never could say to Joseph Smith after that, oh yes, you, you gave a translation of this. You had, the, you had the characters in the place, but you never took him to a real scholar. You never got a, a top opinion on it, did you? He did take it to the best scholar in the world, had Harris take it there, and he got his opinion on it. He said he couldn't read the sealed book and so forth, and he said, bring them back and I'll read them to you, and he got huffy about it, but of course he couldn't read, he was bluffing. That's why he got so huffy. But you couldn't, we couldn't say that the, the Book of Mormon uh, wasn't, that the world wasn't given a chance in that case. Because it says, as it says in the 20th verse here, the learned shall not read them, Touch not the things which are sealed. That's very particular here. Thou shalt seal up and hide them up that I may preserve the words which thou hast not read until I see fit in mine own time to reveal all things. So this is the way it happens. Well, we get on with this in a hurry. And then this is why, of course, 25th verse here. For as much as this people draw near unto me with their mouth 
and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of man. Uh, is this the situation today, you see? We certainly draw near one with our lips, and, uh, but have we removed our hearts far from them? Not everybody, no, there are, there are, there are people in the world who, whose hearts are set because of their sufferings. And their fear toward them is taught by the precepts of men. Well, if they fear me, the precepts, that's better than nothing. But, he says, he's got to bring forth a marvelous work and a wonder. And notice here, their works are in the dark, and they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Did you ever hear about insider trading? There's big money in that, but the whole thing, of course, who seeth us? And Well, I mean, all these takeovers, uh, favorable or unfavorable. Anyway, they have to be done in secret. They have to, uh, all of a sudden, you find your company taken over, and you didn't know about it. You may have a billion-dollar company, and you're taking over a hostile takeover, and what can you do about it, and so forth. It's all done in the dark, these things. They're, they're arranged by offices in certain places, you know. Who seeth us, who knoweth us. And Lebanon, down here in the 20th year's prophecy again, shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. Interesting that they pick on Lebanon for the big ecological change, uh, because Lebanon is, is the great paradox, of course. Lebanon is the richest. That's the old Phoenician country. And uh, they still call themselves Phoenician. We had a uh, Lebanese girl here not long ago. She became furious as she said she spoke Arabic, which of course it was, because she said, no, we speak Phoenician. And they do, they do have a lot of words that are different in, 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 uh, in Beirut and so forth. But look what a mess, I mean. Was there ever such a complete jumble? It's a stew that's stirring all the time, all sorts of them, all fighting each other. Lebanon is in a state of complete chaos. Now, it's been there for, that way for some years now, hasn't it? So, does that mean the inhabitants, when, when there's nobody there, it'll become a fruitful, for, a fruitful field? No, a fruitful field, and the field shall become as a forest. No, they're replanting those. I mean, that area is becoming forested again, and it's... It's a fruitful field, but they build in Lebanon, you know, they build on terraces, terrific terraces. I mean, they go up, up thousands of feet like that, and they're very good at cultivating them. But uh, the change, that Lebanon should be the center of change, the center of violent change, both natural and social, is an interesting thing, because it still is. I mean, the, the latest troubles, the Israelis are daily bombing over in Lebanon there, now in Sidon, uh, now across the board in, in, in the Becca Valley or somewhere like that. Well, the terrible one is brought to naught, and that which they all which watch for iniquity are cut off. So let's not watch for iniquity. There are four things you must never do. Joseph Smith talks about four things. He doesn't laugh in that way, but separately he discusses them. The first, of course, is to aspire. He says Satan aspired, and that was his undoing. Never aspire, never be ambitious. You don't aspire in this world. If you're going to get anything you want in the next, this message is going to get here. To aspire, never accuse. Of course, Satan is the accuser. Diabolus, the word diabolus. Devil, from which the name devil comes, mean accuse, accuser. He's the, called the accuser of his brethren in the scripture. And Adam said to Satan, I will not bring a railing accusation against thee. Let God judge between me and thee. Adam would not accuse Satan after what Satan had done to him, you see. So we don't accuse anybody, no matter how guilty they are. And then you do not contend. The first thing the Lord says to the Nephites is, there shall be no more contentions among you as there have been, he says. This is my gospel, that there shall be no contentious, all contentious cease. For contention is not of me, but all contention is of the devil, who stirreth up the children of men to anger, to bloodshed, to things like that. So we never contend, and we never coerce, of course, if that's the case. And those are the four things everybody wants to do today. Everybody is aspiring, high office and so forth. Everybody accuses in order to get it. Uh, everybody... Uh, Contends. It's a very contentious world we live in. It's a, it's a competitive world. And we back it all up in the end. The bottom line is force. We have to have the force, the coercion. Okay? The four things, we've got them all. Well, let me see now. Uh, oh, here he goes, yes, now. The 28th chapter. They watch for Nicky. Now the 28th chapter. Moving along here, the prophecies are continuing. Shall come to pass the day the churches which are built up well. Uh, they contend one with another. And with their, and this is, a, I like this verse here, this fourth verse of the 28th chapter. They teach with their learning and deny the Holy Ghost, which giveth utterance. You, see, you teach with their learning. It will always be inadequate, of course, it will. Uh, but you, to do that, the usual thing is you deny the Holy Ghost. It's a vanity. And they deny, in that, they deny the power of God. Hearken unto ye, my people, if they shall say, a miracle is wrought, believe it not. By the hand of the Lord, believe it not. This is what they'll teach. They shall say, eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow we'll die, and it shall be well with us. And then they shall say, fear God, eat, drink, and be merry, nevertheless, fear God. We want it both ways, in other words. This is the thing. Are you going to get it both ways? Well, this eighth verse, eat, drink, and be merry. 
Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin, because it's human nature. We do it, of course. Yea, lie a little, take advantage of one because of the words, dig a pit for his neighbor. Notice these are legal and business stratagems that are taught here at the BYU as commendable and practiced. I know people who practice them and think it's great. <laughs> yes, uh, to pull off a fast one, you know. Uh, well, no, we give, a, we give lectures and have, uh, we had a big, big wheel from the East uh, last year, wasn't it, giving uh, talks on stale, stale stratagem, stale strategy. Strategies defined by the dictionary as deceit, practice, deception practiced on an enemy. That's what it is. It's deception practiced on an enemy. It's supposed to be legal if you practice it on an enemy. So, but when you use strategy against a customer, you see, you use strategy, you're trying to deception and you guard who is your enemy because he's resisting you. You're trying to overcome him. He's trying to give you as little as he can. You're trying to get as much as you can. You have to look at him as, as one who has to be approached with strategy, with all sorts of tricks and devices. Not necessary, really. Well, the world we live in. He will, this is a better commentary than you could ask for, take advantage of one because of his words, dig a pit for thy neighbor, there's no harm in this, I say. Do all these things, for tomorrow we die. Very interesting, you know, so we get a little later on, this is the, this is the teaching of Korahor. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. But, but tomorrow we die, of course, is live it up like there was no tomorrow. But if there was, well, God will beat us with a few stripes in that there. There shall be many which shall teach after this manner, in this sort of way. This is the sort of teaching. This isn't, this, this isn't an articles of faith or anything. This is the type of doctrine that will be taught. There shall be many that shall be teach after this manner. False, vain, and foolish doctrines, and shall be puffed up in their hearts, and shall seek to hide their counsels from the Lord, and their works shall be in the dark. They have Swiss accounts, you see. There's, that's the works in the dark, you see. And the... Uh, and someone pays for it. The blood of the saints is over. They, they have all gone out of the way. They have become corrupted. Notice it. And then we read down in the 14th verse here. All have gone astray, save it be a few who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they do err because they are taught by the precepts of men. Because of the pride, the false teachers, the false doctrines of churches, they rob the poor for their fine sanctuaries. Because of their fine clothing, this this, of course, in the 8th chapter of Mormon, this takes it right home to us today and makes this, this is quite explicit there, you see. Why do you adorn yourselves with that which has no life? says, let the poor and the sick, afflicted and needy, pass by you and notice them not. We studiously notice them not. Well, anyway, all the wise in the 15th verse, notice these are the three vanities, the wise and the learned and the rich, those who are clever and those who know so much and those who have it. They are puffed up in pride of their hearts, and all those who preach false doctrines, and all those who commit whoredoms. Who birth. Now, we think that this means nothing anymore. I mean, all you have to do is look at the Sunday paper and so forth, and you, and you see that so-and-so is no longer, uh, are no longer that way. And they've been living together for the last three years. And these are well-known, popular, uh, beloved figures of stage screen, not stage, of screen and, uh, and television. The whoredoms have become part of their our way of life today. It's very common. I'm not fooling you there, am I? Uh, you call his, your girlfriend, or he has a, her, his friend, and uh, they live that way. Woe unto them that turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Ah, the technicalities. The technicalities of the law. In the day that they are fully ripe, they shall perish. But he's, letting, he's giving us a lot of rope. You'll notice that. When they are fully ripe, they'll take care of themselves. That's 80 again, you see. That's the, when you reach the point of no return, when you are fully ripe. Well, but behold, the great and abominable church, the horror of all the earth, and must tumble. Then we go back to Nephi 10.16 when he says that all those who fight against Zion are uh, the great and abominable. But who is Zion? Well, don't flatter yourself on that because we come right to that now. That day he shall rage in the hearts of the children of men and stir them up to anger against that which is good. All you have to do is name a, a few buzzwords and people get absolutely furious. Uh, now here is here is Zion. All Others he will pacify and lull them away into carnal security, and they will say, All is well in Zion. Well, who claims to be Zion? Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them carefully. Notice, uh, this trick has been carefully arranged. Uh, There's a nice equation here. The, uh, leadeth them carefully down to hell. Now, you notice prosperity, like, like life itself, is a blessing. 
But it's not a sign of blessedness, as, as Wilfred Woodruff and John Taylor used to. When the church started being prosperous in their days, they started warning the saints, don't mistake prosperity for virtue. You seem to think because the Lord blesses the Nephites when they're good for just three generations, uh, that if you're rich, that means you're good. You see, at least means you're smart. If you're, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich and so forth? Well, how is it? Uh, last year, there were, uh, how was it, 2,800 new millionaires made every month? Well over a million now. You have to be a genius to be in that, that uh, how many great composers do we have? How many great poets do we have? How many great painters do we have? You can count them on the figures of probably the thumbs of one hand. And yet we have literally millions of millionaires. And we think, ah, oh, this is the sign of wit, of greatness, of achievement, and so forth. Well, Zion prospereth, notice the emphasis on prospereth, all is well, leads their, whole, their souls carefully down to hell. Uh, the, and behold, others he flattereth away and says, there's no hell, and I am no devil. Now, this is a very common belief that there's no devil. He's not personal and so forth. Uh, you make people feel good, and you'll win, of course, in our side. You'll sell, you'll sell your product. <laughs> this terrible competition. Now, this is, a, this is an example of the depth of our civilization. The, the battle of the century this week is between McDonald's and Burger King. Burger King spent $200 million on a special uh, advertising campaign that went right into the hole because the words weren't in a five-word sentence. They weren't arranged just quite right. So they were millions of dollars. It took a huge plant on Madison Avenue to turn out five or six words as a slogan. Whereas McDonald's spent $900 million, nearly a billion dollars, and came up with a family formula, and uh, they're in it big, you see. But they spent a billion dollars just to get an image, just for an image you spent it. Well, aren't you supposed to be your own image? And uh, this here, the... Uh, to flatter them and make them feel good, and this is, that's what McDonald's did, you see. They, the whole purpose of uh, the thrust of Burger King, you see, I studied these things very carefully. The <laughs> uh, whole thrust of Burger King was that McDonald's is for kids, but we're for grown-up people. Well, no, everybody wants to be kids in our society, so McDonald's won hands down on that when they were grown up. It always shows them, you know, the adolescent, all this sort of thing, eternal youth. Before the throne of God to be judged according to their works, and then to be, uh, and then they'll e go into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. Notice that is a metaphor. Therefore, woe be unto him that is at ease in Zion. Try to make myself as uncomfortable as possible. Woe be unto him that crieth, all is well. But, but he's going to win. He's going to win if he says all is well. He'll win every time, you notice. Don't criticize. And woe unto him that saith, we have received, and we receive no more. So many return missionaries who say they've now done their work, they've now received their testimony, now they can settle down to business. And this sort of thing, you, you hear that. Uh, a, uh, my son, the one I mentioned, was in the, in, the San Francisco, in the ballet in San Francisco there. He was a bishop in the ward. He was the first counselor of the bishop in the ward in San Francisco. They had a very rich man in the ward. He said what he liked about the church was that it was just like a cafeteria, the gospel. You could go through and take just the things you wanted and leave the rest, you see. And this is, the, this is what you like, you see. The same thing, you see. At ease in Zion, he likes it. Uh, and uh, they say, we have received and we need no more. See, I take this, I'll, I'll accept the word of wisdom, but this I won't take and that and so forth. Tithing, that's a bit too steep. I'll interpret that and so forth. And so you say, well, I've received, I don't need any more, so I've got the gospel and it's wonderful. Well, with this faith-promoting talk, let's finish the chapter here. We have received the word of God, and we need no more of the word of God, for we have enough. I will give noise as I'm going to continue to give it. Line upon line, it's from the Scriptures, of course. Precept upon street, precept, here a little and there a little. Of course, he goes on. God doesn't cease at all. It's funny, we have thousands of volumes adding to the gospel of teaching. That's what the council of the church do. They reinterpret them, which is, means they're adding elements that are missing, and they have to be supplied by their wit and wisdom. Men can add to the gospel, as uh, the late Cardinal what's his name said, uh, men can add to the gospel, but God may not, because he's spoken his final word. He can't, but we can add to it all we want by reinterpreting and so forth. So, for unto him that receiveth I will give more, and from them that shall say we have enough shall be taken away what they have. Curse. And that's so, of course, in any art or science, any study you're doing. If you say you have enough, I've got my terminal degree, and that's it. You're not going anywhere then. See? Cursed is he that puts his trust... Well, this is the, the end, you see. In man or maketh flesh his arm, or shall hearken unto the precepts of men, the experts, in other words. Notice his government, military business. They put their trust in man and maketh flesh their arm. Woe be unto the Gentiles. They will deny me, but if they will repent, be all right with them. So that's that happy chapter.